So we are recording and today is March 18th, 2020. This is a call sponsored by the Taos Institute. We call this a dialogue with the author and we're really excited that you've chosen to join with us today in this virtual space where we can socially connect without physically being together in this challenging time. And I wanna welcome Reinhard to our call today who is our featured author and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so I just wanted to let you know a little bit about the Taos Institute. If you're new to the Taos Institute and you haven't participated in one of our programs yet, my name is Dawn Dole and I'm the executive director of the Institute. And the Institute is committed, we're a nonprofit educational organization. We're committed to the belief that social constructionist ideas have powerful and positive implications for human life and well being. And we began as a group of scholars and practitioners who came together in the early 1990s for the first time in Taos, New Mexico, thus our name. And we came together to explore the social processes and the relational practices that are essential for the co-construction of reason, knowledge, and human value. And then their application in relational collaborative and appreciative practices around the world. So we're really excited when we get together and um, have this opportunity to share ideas and practices that are based in social construction where we co-create the world that we wanna live in through our relational practices. So welcome to this program. And we also um, invite you to visit our website and see the many, many other resources and programs that we offer. Today, our dialogue with the author is with Reinhard Stettler. And Stelter. Stelter. And yes. um, he, he, he's the author of The Art of Dialogue and Coaching. And this book invites readers to engage in transformative and fruitful dialogues in everyday working life. And it provides the theory and tools for them to be able to do so. This book is an essential guide for coaches in practice and in training, coaching psychologists and professionals with a coaching role, including mentors, consultants, and leaders. And in particular, it'll appear, appeal to those looking to conduct dialogue as an art form, enhancing the work as a co-creative and collaborative guide. And Reinhard is a professor of sport and coaching psychology at the University of Copenhagen. And he's the head of the coaching psychology unit, Department of Nutrition, Exercise and Sport Sciences, and a visiting professor at the Copenhagen Business School. He's re received further training in psychotherapy, counseling, coaching psychology, social constructionism, narrative therapy and practice, and applied sport psychology. So I, with a warm, warm welcome to all of you and to Reinhard, um, I will, before I turn it over to him, I'm just gonna welcome everybody who's just joined. And if you can find the chat button at the bottom of your screen and go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat, say your name, where you are in the world, and um, we welcome you to this call. So Reinhard, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Yes. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you uh, to all of you uh, that you have joined in and uh, show interest in uh, what I uh, plan to, to say uh, in the next uh, hour and a half. So uh, I think uh, I'm quite excited because uh, I'm, I haven't done so many webinars yet and I'm getting used to, to the technology now. and. Uh, and uh, it's uh, actually quite uh, fantastic uh, that we have this opportunity, especially in these times where we uh, shouldn't be outside. In, in Denmark, uh, we are not uh, allowed to be more than uh, 10 people in, in public and uh, also in private uh, spaces. So um, this is a very uh, good uh, possibility to to join in and to, to, to be together on a, on a topic. So I'm very happy that uh, this uh, uh, opportunity is given to me by, by the Taos Institute. So thank you very much for, for that. Um, 
As you can hear, I'm not a native speaker in, in English. I'm uh, originally from Germany. I moved to Denmark uh, many years ago uh, because I met a Danish uh, a woman uh, who was studying at the University of Kiel in Northern Germany and I decided to move to, to Denmark. But uh, now I'm actually married to a German a woman and uh, who is working as a psychologist so we have a lot to, to share with each other and I also have a daughter uh, uh, who is now 30 years old and uh, she's working human resource management and I was able to uh, take her with me and uh, another colleague last uh, or now it's a bit more than a year ago to to the 25th uh, uh, Jubilee uh, conference in Cancun in Mexico so that was really a great time so uh, yeah I would like to uh, to maybe start a bit uh, talking about um, my path uh, as you can could hear from the introduction Don uh, gave uh, my background is in uh, sp originally in sports psychology so and uh, my book writing journey was actually somehow started, uh, I, my first book at the Danish Psychological Publisher was actually a handbook in coaching, uh, in sports psychology. And uh, I was asked by the director of the, the publishing house whether I would be interested to write a book which is more for practitioners. Uh, and uh, he probably thought more uh, in the direction of uh, mental training or something like this. And uh, uh, this was in the end of uh, uh, the, uh, the first, this first uh, book came out in 1999. And uh, at that time I said, no, I'm not interested to write a book like this because there has been a, another book right uh, new on the market at that time. And uh, I said, I would like to think a bit uh, uh, about your offer. And a couple of months later, I came back and said, I would like to write a book on coaching. And uh, that was at that time, uh, so this is uh, uh, 20 years ago, uh, at that time, coaching in Denmark was fairly new. There was only one book, which was uh, published by uh, John Whitmore, which was translated to Danish and which came out in 1995 and uh, so I actually wrote a book uh, on uh, which had the Danish title translated coaching learning and development so that was my 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 uh, journey and then uh, I was asked 10 years later to maybe write an updated version of this book which was actually quite successful it came in 15 uh, uh, editions, so it was really uh, actually a best-selling uh, book. So, and I said, no, I don't want to uh, just renew an old one. I need to do something very different. And during that time, I was uh, actually becoming aware that uh, also times has changed during the last uh, 10 years since my first book came out. And I will go uh, a bit more into that. And uh, I was looking for a, a not so academic title because I mean, if you just call this uh, coaching as a narrative collaborative practice, uh, no, nobody will really buy this book because it's a too academic title. So I actually came up with another, uh, with a term and called this third generation coaching. And I will go into this uh, a, a bit later, why, why it's third generation coaching. Uh, and it's also interesting to go into it, what, is the, what are the first two generations then? So that, that was uh, my journey uh, uh, at that point. So this book came out and, and it, uh, it's also translated to to English, it's called a guide to third generation coaching. And uh, then uh, I was asked to uh, write an essential version of uh, this book. And I also refused to do this because I mean, then I had to decide, so what, what should I take uh, in and what should I leave out? 
So I decided to uh, write this book, uh, which originally came out in, in Danish. And uh, there the title is actually slightly different. I was able to, um, yeah, to uh, not to include the title of uh, uh, the, uh, the term coaching in the title. There the book had, uh, was called The Art of Lingering uh, in Dialogue. That was the, uh, the, origin, the translated title of the Danish book. But the English publisher didn't ac accept this title. So they said, uh, and it was probably more marketing reasons. So if you Google, then coaching is a good term to Google. So they said, art of, the art of dialogue in coaching. So this is uh, how this uh, book uh, title ended uh, up with. And uh, somehow I'm, I'm satisfied uh, uh, and I put a slight uh, uh, subtitle it, uh, under it, Towards Transformative Exchange. Because this is actually something which I think is the key uh, of uh, this uh, uh, understanding that I really try to break up the idea of uh, the more traditional coaching, which is actually more a one-way uh, and asymmetric dialogue. It's uh, just where the, the, the normal, and I would say the first generation coaching is something where you really are focused on helping a person to reach specific goals. And I'm not interested in this in the first place. I mean, we all have some kind of ideas in regard to goals and purposes. But what I really want to open up with uh, in this dialogue uh, is that I would like to open up for a reflective space. So this is actually the idea of the uh, third uh, generation coaching, that there are moments of symmetry in the dialogue. So. Uh, and this changes the, the whole agenda of, uh, of uh, uh, coaching. And then that I had also a reason why I wanted to avoid the title somehow uh, 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 of coaching, because coaching is associated with a very broad variety of different uh, dialogical forms. Originally, and this is why I'm... Uh, why, why this trek uh, took me from more from sports psychology to, to coaching psychology, that uh, originally coaching is associ associated with uh, athletics, with sports, and uh, it's very much focused on uh, goal setting and uh, uh, that you, you, uh, you develop your potential in, in some certain way. So there's also a specific kind of ontology behind this, so an understanding of how humans work. So they are isolated in somehow and they focus on uh, developing uh, their own agenda and uh, a coach in this traditional uh, way uh, was uh, uh, helping a kind of facilitator of the, this dialogue, which was on the premises of, uh, uh, of the coachee. So and uh, there is another reason why I uh, changed uh, the uh, agenda of, uh, of coaching and why I talk about third generation coaching is because there is a change of, uh, in our society during the last 20, uh, 25 years since coaching really became uh, big in, in also the uh, field of organizations and, uh, and uh, many other areas. So, so I'm when I talk about these three generations. So, where the first is on on goal setting, the second uh, uh, generation is more that we still try. To, it's very much influenced by a systemic thinking, where you still try to keep neutral in this uh, 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 systemic uh, agenda, where you try to help somebody, but you use different styles. So it's also Maybe a solution-focused uh, coaching would be also a, 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 a second-generation uh, uh, coaching. And of course, I don't talk about when I when I speak about uh, third-generation coaching. I only use this to really dis describe my different intentions. So of course, sometimes I use 
some methods from the first uh, uh, generation coaching agenda and I frequently use a lot uh, from second uh, generation coaching but I try to move myself to be this collaborative partner this co-reflecting uh, uh, partner in, in, in the dialogue. And uh, I will come to this uh, a bit later. So, so when I talk about a coaching uh, in this uh, third generation uh, way, I really think also that the agenda in, uh, has changed in regard to uh, how we see society. And uh, I'm quite Im uh, impressed uh, by a, a a colleague uh, who is philosopher who works in Germany and Berlin, but he is originally South Korean. And uh, during the last uh, maybe five years, he has become very popular also in the English language uh, 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 regions because he's, uh, he is getting translated uh, quite a bit. His name is Bu Jong Shul Han. Uh, his uh, surname is H-A-N, so it's very easy to remember. He has written a book, it's, uh, uh, I think it's one of the first books, but it's translated to, to English. It's called The Burnout Society. And um, when I'm thinking about my wife, who's working as a psychologist, she actually works in uh, organization and work psychology at the municipality of Copenhagen. And uh, most of the people who contact her are having problems with stress and burnout or lack of well-being in, in, in the job, uh, uh, in, the, in their working environment. And this is a growing problem. And uh, Han, uh, uh, actually in his uh, book, and the good thing about uh, Han is that these books are not very thick. So you can read them during a weekend. So that really makes them also attractive. But it's very uh, dense and not an easy read, but uh, I think you get a lot of out of it. And he focuses on, uh, and maybe I can uh, go into uh, some of the slides which I have prepared. So, um, so this is actually my argument why third generation coaching? So, and I think uh, uh, the essential for me is actually to focus on societal change. And here I uh, go also into this. Uh, uh, yeah, in the first place, I I would like to quote uh, a number of uh, of uh, sociologists. So uh, Ulrich Beck is also a German uh, sociologist. He speaks that we are living in a world of globality and now with this uh, COVID-19 virus, uh, we can really feel, ev everybody can feel that we are in this world of globality. If we wouldn't travel, if we wouldn't have this exchange uh, uh, globally, we wouldn't have uh, all these uh, uh, problems at the moment. But it's also, you know, that uh, there are specific challenges. We have to relate to different cultures and we, have to uh, integrate the local and the global uh, somehow uh, also in our way of thinking. Uh, another uh, German sociologist who is a systemic uh, uh, thinker, he speaks about that we are living in a hyper-complex society. And this means, uh, hyper-complexity means that even if we put ourselves on a, a second order uh, position, we are not able to really grasp the complexity of our society. And uh, the third perspective, and uh, Anthony Giddens, uh, is an English uh, sociologist, who is focusing more on uh, these uh, psychological aspects, he says that self-reflexivity is a basic condition of our society, uh, of everybody in our society. So this is uh, actually the biggest challenge. And he really talks somehow, uh, or Anthony Giddens really talks into this 
uh, third uh, generation agenda, although he never has um, uh, an idea about uh, or never talked about uh, coaching. And the last point is uh, where I will refer, refer to our good colleague uh, Ken Gergen, uh, who uh, already more than 20 years ago highlighted the uh, issue of identity uh, as a central issue and also that we really, and this has become really big uh, during the maybe the last uh, five, 10 years, that we really work on our self-presentation, even uh, through social media and, uh, and so on. So, but now I would like to go into uh, uh, Bu Zhong Chu Han a bit more, uh, who has written this book, Burn, uh, Burnout Society. So he talks about the changes during the last 10, 20 years. So he speaks about that the 20th century was a time where we could talk uh, about immun immunology. And uh, so that means that we could distinguish between what is us and what is our own and what is foreign. So we could distinguish between friend and enemy, between own uh, things, own issues, and foreign issues. And this will become more clear when we th think about uh, uh, further uh, what he's talking about. Now he speaks, we are living in a time of supremacy of positivity. This has nothing to do with uh, positive psychology. It has much more to do that we have and maybe this is also based on an economic ag agenda of uh, new public management, uh, where we in all, and this is maybe more seen in, in Europe and in the welfare state that we are really pushed and all the people who work in the public sector, they have to work like, like much more uh, as uh, pri uh, in private companies, they are pushed and the, the idea is you can do more. So, uh, and this is the idea uh, of supremacy of positivity. Said so, and this leads uh, in, in many fields to to a kind of overcapacity and overload in regard to communication. Uh, we can talk about uh, hyperactivity. Uh, we also uh, all pushed in a direction of uh, multitasking, so that we watch TV and at, uh, at the same time we look at the computer uh, uh, and this leads actually somehow to a shallow attention so that we are not really very focused on one thing. And the consequences of uh, this is that we are getting tired. We are getting exhausted and this can lead to stress and even further to depression uh, and uh, uh, a lot of children, uh, especially boys, uh, get this uh, attention deficit disorder uh, uh, diagnosis. And uh, so the idea uh, is now, and this is the change from the t uh, in regard to what, how we could see ourselves in the 20th century. Now we see ourselves as subjects and victims of our own performance. And if you especially think about young people who really post a lot uh, uh, in the, uh, via social media, via Facebook, via Instagram, they always fight to, to present themselves in the best possible way. And this leads finally to a kind of uh, a power control which is based on a kind of self-surveillance of our own performance. So we think we can do better. And we are, uh, it's not our boss anymore who is the first who tells us that we are not good, uh, doing good enough. It's actually that we think about this uh, uh, on, our, uh, on our own. And this is the, uh, the, basis, uh, the basic challenge uh, for a lot of uh, uh, psychological dysfunction in our time. And so you can see, if you stick to this first uh, 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 generation coaching agenda, you will actually push people more in this direction. 
so that they think, oh, I need to have another goal. I have to do better. Please coach, come and help me to do uh, uh, a better work to do uh, to uh, that I can improve in this and this direction. So this is actually a trap. First generation coaching as an exclu exclusive tool to help people is a trap for these people because it will strengthen their self surveillance and their focus on whether they are doing good, uh, good enough uh, in regard to their working life or whatever, uh, uh, this will happen. And you can see my struggle has also been that I, uh, in my work as a, uh, uh, on a master program of, uh, of leaders in public uh, organizations, they, uh, they think they can be coaches. And I think, it's really a dangerous uh, uh, thing if, uh, uh, if leaders would like to work as a kind of th first generation coach because every leader has actually his own agenda and uh, you can't, uh, and what is the basis of any kind of coaching is that you really try in the first place, follow the agenda of the coachee or your dialogue partner. So, um, so this is one of the, the basis of uh, uh, why I needed to uh, work on how I could change the agenda of coaching to something uh, new. And uh, there I used the, the term uh, uh, third generation coaching. So we are actually, that's what uh, Bijong Chulhan tells us, we are living in a control society where self-disciplining uh, uh, is uh, uh, strengthened and where we use self-surveillance through social media and many report systems which any uh, organization and any businesses, uh, uh, all businesses uh, use today. So this is actually the, 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 the dangerous uh, thing about if we would continue on this first generation coaching uh, uh, basis. So, and I would like to introduce you with another uh, psychologist It's actually a brand new book. He is also German, and uh, he, his name is Hartmut Rosa. And this book, which you see the title, uh, it's called Resonance. And uh, he doesn't talk about uh, a, a dialogue directly. He, tr he actually describes uh, some kind of... He works on a sociology for a good life. That, this is his uh, agenda. And this uh, book you uh, see there uh, with the title uh, 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 Resonance is actually a book of more than 500 pages. So it's quite, uh, quite a uh, big book. Uh, it's uh, recently translated to, uh, from German to uh, English. And uh, he has written a big work earlier he is actually the fourth generation of Frankfurt School. So this is the school of Jürgen Habermas, you, you might know also in, in, uh, uh, internationally. Um, so it's the Frankfurt School, it's called Critical Theory. And he, Hartmut Rosa, has written a, a very big uh, a book about acceleration. And he was, in, in this book, he described processes how society on all levels from the technological development from uh, 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 individual changes uh, to social changes is on a track of acceleration so everything goes faster i mean remember 10 years ago we hardly had smartphones uh, so uh, on this uh, technological dimension it had has been and during our uh, just the last 10, 15, 20 years, it has been a revolution in regard to, uh, to changes. So, and his agenda after he has written this, you know, critical uh, perspective on how society has changed, he wanted to have a different, uh, put, put a different angle on, on, on things. So he focuses on. Uh, resonance. 
So uh, you can very briefly say if acceleration is the problem, he, he, could, uh, he would state then resonance might be the, res uh, the solution. And res uh, 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 resonance you can see in a lot of ways in social interaction, in going out in nature, in meeting other people, in uh, social networks, uh, being together with the family. So he writes uh, a lot uh, on all different issues, which I uh, uh, don't want to go into, but he actually doesn't write about dialogue. So this, this is actually the perspective I'm, uh, uh, I, I, I was inspired just at the time when I was writing this book. So in the English uh, translation of this, uh, uh, the art of dialogue and coaching, I could really put a, a final reference in it because I was talking about resonance. And then suddenly there was this guy, Hartmut Rosa, who was speaking about resonance and who has written a whole book about it. And I thought, I think, Resonance is a perfect term in regard to um, describing the relationship of transformative dialogues. And this is actually, um, now I have introduced another term, transformative dialogues, and I would like to uh, argue for that uh, because there is so much confusion about the term coaching, I'm actually preferring transformative dialogue as uh, uh, the term which I think is uh, 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 describing my, uh, my ambition. So, uh, so uh, to, to have a look here at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at uh, what true resonance uh, means is actually that the, this uh, old school first generation coaching is uh, in, in that sense, it's somehow out, uh, outdated. So it's not what I'm not in, uh, interested in, just to move a person from A to B. It's not enough. Uh, society is too complex. We don't even know what our what possible goals could uh, could be uh, look like. So we need actually another agenda, and we need to be a dialogical partner on a very different uh, uh, track. So uh, this is actually uh, uh, why I think we need transformative dialogues. And uh, uh, this is a kind of uh, a philosophical stance, you could say. So it's, it's, I would like to help people to find out who they are. And this is, of course, in the agenda of social constructionism, it would be the agenda of helping people to, <clears throat> through, yeah, in this co-creative process. So this is one track uh, which which I uh, I use. So. Um, so, and the, the other uh, uh, idea is, of course, that we also sometimes have a perspective that we look out who we would like to be. So, and the, this is actually these uh, transformative dialogues that they uh, uh, support uh, uh, us in this process of meaning making and uh, uh, to also to help us to find specific uh, ethical values. So what is it really I'm standing for? And my community stands for and my organization stands for. So this is actually one of the, the perspectives I, I will uh, uh, come into uh, a, a bit later. So when I wrote this, uh, 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 my first uh, coaching book in, in English, a guide to third generation coaching, I was looking for a motto. So if you never read the book, it's, uh, you can uh, just, uh, maybe you manage to read the first page. And uh, there I picked this quote of a Buddhist monk uh, who said, in true dialogue, 
both sides are willing to change. So this is the motto of my understanding of transformative dialogues and uh, third generation coaching. And this means that in this process, I mean, and this is different in, uh, in, uh, in, in the perspective of uh, uh, the old school uh, 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 coaching where you have been a more neutral uh, facilitator in the dialogue that I, I'm a much more um, active uh, co-reflecting partner in this dialogue. So, um, so in in this, uh, uh, if we think uh, back to uh, to Bujong Chulhan and his agenda of uh, the burnout society, so we somehow need uh, ways to counterbalance tiredness, exhaustion, and possible burnout. So, and uh, he uh, speaks about the Vita Contemplativa. This goes actually back to the German philosopher Martin Heidegger, who uh, uh, spoke about this. And this is where you use the term, the art of lingering. And where I started to use this term. So, and this picture you can see here, is actually a uh, visualization somehow how uh, this is a break from you know this fast going uh, agenda where these two uh, uh, people stop up on middle on the middle of the track and have a conversation. So it's a kind of illustration to what I'm uh, uh, what I mean by this. So, uh, yeah, I wonder whether it would be a good idea to have a short break uh, before uh, I continue that you go into groups of uh, three uh, and uh, I hope uh, Dawn will help to organize this, uh, that you have a, a reflection about when did you and how uh, did, uh, did your uh, fruitful dialogue look like? <coughs> so imagine a situation where you as a leader, colleague, and a dialogue guide, this is my alternative term to a coachee, where you had a conversation which you really uh, thought was inspiring. How did you experience this? And what were central uh, for, for, for this conversation? So, <coughs> and I also missing my voice uh, for the moment. So it's, I, I think a good uh, break uh, for me also that you uh, use uh, uh, maybe 10 minutes to, to have a talk about this in, in, uh, in groups of three people. So thank you, Reinhard. I will, I will set up the breakout groups. I welcome everyone to follow the screen prompts. Uh, when I set up the breakout rooms, you will get a prompt on your screen that says, I would like to join the breakout room. If you click join or yes, um, it will take you to a private space with three or four other people. And these questions will not be in the room with you. So jot down the question. I think the, the big question is, when have you been in a transformative dialogue? Um, you know, and and you really felt inspired and and enlightened. Yeah, yeah. And, and what what are the key principles? What what was it that made this dialogue so intensive and so transformative? Yeah. So you'll have about ten minutes in that conversation space. So uh, maybe a couple minutes per person, um, unless somebody's story just kind of takes the time and you really embellish it and, and explore that and learn from that. Uh, so use your time uh, the way you'd like in that 10 minutes or so. When it's time to come back to our large group, you will get another message in your group that says you have one minute to wrap up. So at that point, you can stay in your group for one more minute, finish up your <coughs> conversation, and then we're going to come back together all together. Any questions on that? Okay. I'm going to hit the create rooms. Tom, how much time will we have in total? 10 minutes. Okay. W would that be fine? 
what do you think Dawn? Would that yeah, be we a... can we can try 10 minutes. You can um uh I'm not even sure you can get to the chat, but if you can if you need more than 10 minutes, chat try to chat me and I'll pay attention and maybe give you a few more minutes. All right, here we go. And Reinhardt, you'll get a message, just don't click on it. Yeah, thank you. Again. Hello, everyone. And we're just going to wait till everybody joins back in. We've still got a couple more seconds for the rooms to close. And hopefully everyone will have at least completed their conversation for the moment. And then we are recording again. And here they come. Yes. Yeah, wonderful. Welcome back. And not everybody's back yet, but they're they're on their way. So we'll just wait another couple seconds. All right, wonderful. Welcome back, everyone. We are continuing with our conversation. And uh, Reinhard, I'm going to turn it over to you to facilitate this next part of our call. So um, I'm curious uh, whether somebody would like to speak up and uh, and uh, reflect uh, about what uh, you were talking about so that I Afterwards, I would like to talk a bit more about what are the features of what I uh, describe as uh, third generation coaching or the art of dialogue uh, in, in, in that sense. So is somebody willing to, to speak to the audience, to all of us? So you'd like them to kind of do a brief capture, summarize of their conversation, yeah. maybe what, yeah. was the, what were the highlights of the, the yes. characteristics of the transformative dialogues. So maybe one person from each group could jump in for just a minute. Um, I, could, it, I can start if you want, or do you have someone else who's starting? Well, Puck, Puck, is that how you say your name, Puck? And you're on mute. So I'll unmute you. OK, so Puck, go ahead. OK. Yes, I'm Puk from uh, Denmark. I was talking to Ole Rasmussen, also from Denmark. We were just talking about this with resonance. I just wonder how do you sense that there is resonance? Is that something you also sense physically? Or, and can you in anywhere compare it to what sports people talk about being in the zone, where you like focus in on one uh, moment yeah shall i shall i uh, do, you, do you want yes. to, uh, to answer this i mean uh, uh, resonance uh, is actually what he describes as something that there are these it's he sees this as a relational concept uh, in that sense that you if you are resonating i mean you share something uh, on a level where you give the other the sense of I understand what you mean on the basis of your own understanding. So it's not, you know, it's not a kind of interpretation. Uh, it's not judgment. It's really to, uh, to where you try to, to stay uh, in tune with the other. I also speak he actually uses the term, and this was something I wanted to show uh, that uh, as a next uh, picture, uh, he speaks actually about the tuning fork, that you are the tuning fork for another person. And I mean, of course, this is uh, quite uh, uh, physical in that sense that you, you the tuning fork has one tone. And if you, uh, 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 yep, uh, push this uh, on the on the table then the, the a tone uh, uh, the a uh, comes up and the, if you hold the tu another tuning fork uh, beside this the tuning fork 
begins to swing in the same uh, on the same tune. And I think this you could also speak about attunement that you really relate to another person to their agenda. And what I am actually thinking about uh, uh, where I use this uh, this phrase is that we do this also uh, in a narrative uh, uh, tradition, we use uh, this outsider witnessing. So it's there where we relate to another person and we really think on what they have said in relation to our own uh, understanding of the world. But we relate, and this is, I mean, it's not the same tune necessarily, but it's somehow that you relate and the, the other person feels to, uh, to be uh, that he or she is heard on the premises of their understanding. So, and if you really uh, are a resonating partner, you really try to enlarge your own perspective and you also enlarge the perspective and the world view or the way of seeing the world for the other because you give something slightly different to the uh, to the conversation and this is actually this uh, uh, situation i'm really looking for that you really relate to something which you have heard and which makes sense from your own perspective so it's not this to be in this uh, specific state which you described from, from sports people, but it's really a dialogical relationship where you bring your own perspective in, but in it's very closely related to what you have heard. I actually use the term that you receive a gift from somebody. I use this metaphor, which is the I think the best way to describe this, that you use, that you give, a, uh, that you receive by listening to the coachee, uh, the di your dialogue partner as the coach, or I talk about dialogue guide, and you reflect back how things make sense from your perspective. So in this, uh, uh, if you really work on this, then it's really something where you develop something new because you suddenly give the other a feeling, oh, I'm, I'm giving something to my dialogue partner or the, the other part. And especially in group uh, work, it's really valuable that you can enlarge the perspective that something is growing very slowly to something more uh, complex to something more that you uh, everybody gets something out because you are thinking from the metaphor what kind of gift do I get from the other and what kind of gift can I give when I listen to you so this is this uh, this dialectic uh, in the in the conversation that you really enlarge the perspective and this is the what I call this co-reflective space that you unfold something and it grows to something that everybody gets yeah more uh, yeah it, it grow the horizons uh, uh, opens uh, uh, somehow so I, I don't know whether it makes uh, uh, this metaphor of give, uh, giving a gift or sharing gifts is uh, uh, something that which really can illustrate the the situation can uh, i ask okay. something um yeah. you know i understand perfectly what you're saying how you can generate a dialogical encounter that broadens everyone's perspective and and do it gently and slowly and show that you've listened carefully to the other person and now you just take it a little bit forward but let's say you were the person who says something like I'm very worried my child's got attention deficit disorder. They've got all these behavioral problems. I don't know how to control my child. Don't you want, you know, you can understand their perspective, yeah. but on the other hand, you want to introduce a totally new way of seeing things. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you're not like saying, yes, yes, I understand your point of view. You actually want to 
put it in a different frame. You yeah. want to say, yeah, right. well, it's not that your child's got a problem. It's not that you must try and control your child. You want to give them a, a completely different perspective yeah. on the issue. And that could be your yeah. gift to yeah. turn it around totally. Yeah. You know, you give them a gift they hadn't expected. <laughs> Yeah, but in the first place, I think it's important that you really share that you are not in control of the situation. And there you can, I think, what I really can hear that you are struggling with not having control about your life, about your child. And this is a very difficult situation you are in. And I know this from myself that I experience situations where I feel not in control. And I think this is something uh, where you can share, uh, uh, so that you really share something of the essential of the situation. So you don't go into this challenge uh, right away, but you help the person to step out. And, and maybe you ca can have a talk about how is it, how does it feel like to be out of control and what and there it could be maybe some, sometimes helpful at some point of time that you share something, a situation where yourself felt that you were out of control of something and how you regain control. Because this is something we, we really struggle with. And I mean, if we take the, the current situation uh, with uh, this uh, COVID-19 uh, 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 virus, I think it's really what people are struggling with. You know, we, we are told here now in Denmark that we should stay at home. We, should, we shouldn't gather with other people. We should work from home. I think what people experience in this situation that they don't have control about their life. So they, they get somehow, you know, they get mad inside because they are only focused on themselves. They cannot share. They don't have these spaces to uh, interact. And that makes them crazy. And I think if you meet these essentials of, of situations, I think that you meet the person on something which is not just their fate, but it's something which goes beyond with everybody uh, uh, some, sometimes uh, uh, notice of, of experiences in, uh, in their life. So and in this situation, it would be something that we, you feel out of control. And uh, let's talk about how is it to be un, uh, out of control. And there you can help and there you can share something uh, from your own experience, how, how it feels like that uh, if, you, if I am as a dialogue guide, if I feel also uh, out of control, what it makes and how I feel and how I experience uh, this situation and what, in which way can we help people uh, 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 help each other to regain control uh, uh, of our uh, of a specific life situation. What, 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 so, would that be a yeah. good, good answer for you or satisfying? I can't hear you. Sorry. Or else you want to re reframe things and say it's not about you know gaining control. And I understand that you're worried because you're not in control, but there may be other ways of living that you, you know, don't try and control everything. And, and yeah. don't, there are other ways of dealing with children that are so-called labeled as hyperactive, you know, yeah. that you, you shift the conversation to a different tune, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not that you, you get in tune, but you start introducing new music. <laughs> Yeah, right. That's, I mean, that's, Reinhard, we've got quite a few other people that have okay. that would yeah. like to uh, move into this conversation. Thank you, Norma. Um, Saliani, do you want to jump on and share what you had in your group? You put some things in the chat, and maybe you want to just say it openly. Uh, maybe they're not here. Um, and then Kristen, you jumped in the chat. Yeah, I would just, and I'd, I'd invite Eileen and Beth and uh, Mio to. Um, share if they think of anything else. But I think there were a couple of things that were, um, I, and I really appreciated the first story about the piece of resonance. I feel like in our, um, in our conversation that we really experienced that. And I really appreciated that with my partners. Um, 
we talked about three different things. We talked about, um, I think talked about the power of asking the second question and often we're flushed with assumptions and that the power of asking that second question was um, an important part of the, the example story. Um, also the space that we are coming from as a dialogic partner that often we really, even though we have intentions for a third generation transformative dialogue and experience, we still come with a lot of our own um, assumptions or agendas or uh, preferences for outcomes and really preparing uh, that space of where we're coming from as a dialogic partner. And then Beth brought up the force field of cultural paradigms that we often don't even see those blind spaces. They're just so much part of, they're innately part of us that it's kind of like we almost go into a trance. Um, but that to see those are important parts of being able to be in that space of a transformative uh, dialogue. So I think that those were, and I just want to appreciate, it was an amazing group. We're going to continue the conversation. Yeah, good. Thank you. Okay. And then um, Beth, do you want to jump in here? You did something in the chat. You don't have to, but if you'd like to, you, you shared in the chat a minute. I mostly said, I thought that was brilliantly expressed by Kristen. I, I just think it's the most fantastically worthwhile webinar and subject and we're all planning to continue the dialogue. It was, you know, uh, 10 minutes wasn't enough to go as deeply as our dialogue went. So yeah, yeah. fantastic. I've, I've shared most of the things. Okay, in the sounds good. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Paloma, would you like to jump in here? You shared on the chat. Uh, yeah, Anne was just sharing her co-active coaching experience with me, and we talked about the intimacy that was being created, and that's part of the importance of that uh, space that some of you call uh, the relational space, and so it's like the being of together and being open to that and the vulnerability, but also how you play with these limits and boundaries, so yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And then, um, Peter, you have a question. Um, would you like to jump in with your question? Um, thank you. I'll, I'll try. Um, because, Reinhard, you just spoke about um, you know, control and um, essentially that we have to face that we're not in control to take this yeah. next step. Now, I'm continuously dealing with people and their identity is so much connected to being in control. Yeah. Um, and there's also a certain disconnect from, from their emotional realm. So my question would be, um, can, I, can I flick a switch to, to get them into this or do I just have to move on and work with the people who are ready? No, I mean, uh, this was just an example with control and I think uh, what is actually, uh, my point was that this is the issue or could be one issue or I see this as, as an issue in this conversation and then I think what I would like to open up uh, is that, I mean, I don't have the answer. I don't know what works for the other, but I would like to circle around. What does it mean to be in control and to be out of control? And wouldn't it be okay from time to time also to lose control or what does control be? The idea of having control all the time, what does it make? Uh, how does it uh, what does it do with uh, with you so sometimes it's maybe also a good idea to to and and this is the conversation i really would like to uh, unfold i would like to go away from you know just having a, a, a fixed solution but i want to invite people to to a reflective space I, and i'm the uh, co-reflecting partner i don't and, and, and this is actually the point that our society, when, when, when the, I, in the first place where I described this uh, society uh, based on uh, Luhmann's uh, words as a hyper-complex hyper society, a hyper-complex society is not controllable anymore. And we cannot control things all the time. So the issue is actually, how do we deal with the uncontrollable? And I think there, and it, it, I can't give an answer how, how to go, but it's this meeting between the other and myself where we might give an answer to us in, which helps us in this situation.
to understand the complexity or the hyper complexity of the world or the life situation of the person who approached me uh, with something. So uh, it's not just presenting solutions. I think solutions are so difficult to find, but it's what I think is important. And this is what I really try to help people with, to, to help them to have a dialogue with me where I'm this co-reflecting partner. And my hope is that we come to something which makes sense for both of us because the struggle the other has is also my struggle from time to time. And if I relate to these struggles we all uh, are in from time to time, I think there will be a meeting place. And, you know, I have worked quite a bit with, uh, also with groups. And that's, you know, sometimes if some person raises something and they think they open their mouth in regard to a specific problem and they just hear, oh, you have, I have actually something similar. And they feel so, just this comment sometimes helps them because a lot of people think they are the only person in the world uh, who has this problem. And just sharing that I'm also feeling sometimes like this helps people to open up, to develop uh, new perspectives, to really share something and to lift this conversation on a more uh, human level, you, you know, where we not talk about moving from A to B, but really reflecting on something which is much more, yeah, on an existential level for people. Because a lot of people struggle in specific life situations because life has become so complex so hyper complex that they can't even see a way out uh, directly. So I, I hope this is somehow a, a bit of an answer to, to, to your comment. Thank, uh, thanks, Reinhardt. And Joan would like to jump in here. Uh, Reinhardt, I, first let me say how much I'm enjoying uh, listening to you this morning. And I think your work is so powerfully important. I do a lot of executive coaching with vice presidents, presidents and CEOs. And this notion of having the freedom to be able to express them that they themselves may be out of control at a moment or suffering despair at a moment is one of the greatest freedoms I think we can give people yeah. in, in coaching because it sets up then that, that place for the possibility of dialogue. And so I just wanted to kind of throw that in and, and make a comment of how powerfully important I think what you're talking about is. Oh, thank you very much, Joan. Any other thoughts, questions, stories to share? I, I just have a question, it's, it's Linda. Um, when you are talking about your the, the sharing and the listening, there's two, you know, psychological concepts that come up to me, and that is um, one of the empathy and self-disclosure throughout that. Yeah. And yeah. I'm wondering if you have a comment on that. Yeah. I think somehow self-disclosure, I mean, self-disclosure is a, a, a old concept in uh, psychotherapy. So, and I also discussed this a little bit in, uh, in, uh, in this uh, book, The Art of Dialogue. And I think there is this part Maybe there's also more possibility to, uh, in regard to self-disclosure when it's not a therapy, when it's more in this perspective of having transformative dialogues. Having, I think we also, I really uh, would like to understand also my understanding of dialogue as a kind of community psychological, uh, uh, from a community psychological perspective. So we can help people to grow if they are together in specific contexts where they can help each other also to grow. So it's, uh, I think uh, 
this perspective and a, a lot of projects uh, I, I, or several projects I have done, I actually worked actively with, uh, with groups. I had a, a larger project where I worked with minority uh, boys and uh, we, we have a, a pool of uh, 25 coaches who uh, work with them and we work with the whole school. And, uh, and I think that, it, you know, that uh, the, the starting point was, you know, they are not really, uh, maybe they, they feel somehow in their identity between two different cultures. Uh, they are somehow in the Danish culture, in, in my case, and they have the, the culture of their parents, and sometimes the parents don't even speak the language uh, of the country. So they are in struggle, and, I, uh, and they struggle between these two identities. And it's so helpful that to open up for a space where, where people really find uh, something where they can interact about the challenges they are in. And what I really try to do is to lift the conversation on something more general, on something, uh, and I speak what, a term I use, I would like to be a fellow human companion. This is my basic idea. So that I'm a companion for the other, and the other is also a companion for the others, if, uh, if we talk about a group context. So there is an element of self-disclosure in it. And the other perspective, if you speak about empathy, I think empathy is, of course, very important. But empathy is mo mostly on an emotional level. And I would like to introduce something of, uh, you know, a kind of co-reflection or co-creative or shared meaning uh, into it, which I think is not covered by the term uh, empathy. So it's... It's going actually somehow beyond the term of uh, of empathy. I don't know whether this makes sense for you. Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. It moves My out pleasure. beyond it. Yeah. Yeah. So Reinhardt, we are coming to our to our closing time. Okay. And if you just you, we've got a couple minutes. Do you want to summarize for us or? Do you have any final thoughts or comments? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's uh, time is going so fast. So I think uh, what, what I wanted to uh, uh, stress is really that we need to have different kind of uh, dialogues which go much more beyond uh, old school dialogues in the way that we are just can keeping uh, us outside the dialogue as being just a facilitator. I think the the phrase the or the metaphor of sharing gifts is uh, one of the key uh, uh, features, uh, and uh, to be a fellow human companion would be another uh, one. And a third one would be, and this is something where, which goes beyond the, these first and second generation coaching, that you have moments of symmetry in the dialogue. And this is not the normal either for traditional coaching, and it's not uh, uh, normal for uh, psychotherapy. So in that sense, there is an in-between space. I, I would like to help people to really grow, but I would like to use myself with on, on this level where I try to grasp somehow an essential perspective. And I think uh, the, the, situ, uh, the case of uh, uh, having control or losing control is something which is maybe uh, uh, was a very good example for, uh, uh, in our conversation here, that if we are able to also include a perspective of something more human, more uh, maybe even also uh, focusing on specific values, uh, uh, which are uh, important for us. So it's on this uh, level, I think if we meet there and uh, on a more uh, abstract or, or a fellow human perspective, 
and move away from a specific problem or a specific idea of where we want to go to uh, and open up the space to, to something more where we can re reflect on, on, a, on an issue on a more abstract and uh, human uh, and uh, fellow human perspective, which we all share the struggles we have in our uh, our society. And I think the the current situation, uh, more and more people feel like in, 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 in regard to this uh, COVID-19 uh, virus is actually a challenge. So, and we, we tackle this in a different, uh, in different ways and different, we see this as a, as a, an opportunity. Uh, we, we see this as a, uh, you know, a really existential uh, threat. And I think if we meet there on this, uh, in this space where, where we can meet on and reflect on something which, how it uh, uh, has an impact on our uh, current life situation, then we move away from the concrete and we move uh, to a, a space where we, where we meet each other as human beings. And I think this is there, new meaning can, can evolve and, uh, and grow. And uh, I think this is uh, something which I think uh, is essential for, for my way of uh, really trying to be artful in, in, uh, in the way of uh, having transformative dialogues. So Reinhard, as we come to a close here, thank you so much. Um, I want to invite everyone to continue this conversation with you um, and each other online. And you'll see in the chat, I put a link to our um, Taos Institute online learning community space. And we have a special page set up for conversation just for this conversation. And that link is there. If you click on the link and you're not a current member of this online learning community, it is free. You can go ahead and join and then click on that link again and it'll take you right to that page. And you'll see at the bottom of the page, there's a conversation space. I invite Reinhardt to go there after this call. If you all just want to join in there for a few minutes just to touch base and get connected that way, um, there's a feature on that page that you can have if you click on the word following. That means you're going to follow this conversation and you'll get a notification in your email when somebody posts to this conversation so you can jump back in and participate. So I welcome everyone to do that. Um, also, we have these uh, dialogue with the authors once a month. Be looking for the announcement for April and May and June. And I just want to thank everyone for this rich conversation and for joining us today with the, at the Taos Institute. And thank you so much, Reinhard, for sharing your book. Um, I, I think everybody has the link to the book. If not, it's also on that community page that you're uh, welcome to join. Um, and just be well, everyone. And, and thank you so much, Reinhard. Thank you, too. Uh, I really enjoyed talking to you. And uh, I think the conversation also grew through your comments and uh, reflections and it uh, gave me possibility to really come to some essentials in, uh, in the way how I, I think and try to uh, work with other people on having uh, good uh, dialogue. So thank you very much uh, uh, everybody and I will stay in touch through uh, uh, this uh, uh, link and uh, I hope we can t continue for a while. So thank you very much and uh, bye bye. Yeah, and I will also post the video of this call there. So if you have other people that didn't join today that you think would get something out of the video, they're welcome to join that page also. Thank you. Yep. Take care. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah. bye. Thank you very much. Good seeing you again.